Welcome to the family here on Purple Mafia. I am your host, Paladino Joey, or Joey Awajan. Purple Mafia is available on all of your favorite podcasting apps. I thank you once and always for downloading and listening to this show. It is always a great pleasure to be back on board with you once again today. The Minnesota Vikings hosted the New Orleans Saints, jumped to a 27-3, no, 24-3 lead in the first half, and ultimately win 27-19. Well, they won. Uh, It wasn't a great game, but they won. Uh, Josh Dobbs in the first half. Joshua Dobbs. Josh Dobbs in the first half looked like, I don't know, Michael Vick, Steve Young. uh, I don't know. Enter talented mobile quarterback. Second half, he looked more like a backup quarterback. I don't know. I thought he was pretty good for the most part, but it seemed like all the numbers, all the sexy yardage and statistics were all in the first half for the most part, and they pretty much were. T.J. Hawkinson had a massive game, 11 catches, 134 yards, and a touchdown. Kind of reminded you of his performance versus the performance versus the New York Giants on that in that whiteout on Christmas Eve last year. That was a lot of fun. Uh, since then, not so much. Luckily, Alvin Kamara did not uh, repeat his Christmas Eve performance in the in the U.S. Bank Stadium years ago on 2020 when he had six touchdowns. That was insulting, embarrassing. But, uh, yep, uh, he had seven uh, catches for 33 yards and 42 yards on nine carries. They're not bad numbers in a couple of key plays, two uh, two-point conversions during the New Orleans comeback. And, um, obviously, again, a couple of key third downs as well that really helped move the, uh, the chains for the New Orleans Saints and get things moving forward. Minnesota Vikings, though, win their fifth game in a row. So a one and four start, but it's like all the numbers, all the statistics point to there's no way in hell this team makes the playoffs. At this point, it would be probably kind of disappointing if the Vikings missed the playoffs um, with a six and four record. We should be able to make at least the seventh seed. We got to see Ty Chandler as the feature running back in today's game. So a lot of us kind of got what we, we wanted forever. Looks pretty good. Um, He's a two-down running back, not a three-down running back. Alexander Madison is in the role he probably should be in, a third-down running back, kind of back where he was during the um, Dalvin Cook days. Also, again, um, Joshua Dobbs is showing that incredible uh, escapability, mobility, and all of that. Really loved what he could do, but he also showed he can throw the football pretty well. Uh, Second half, though, the New Orleans Saints, you got to remember Dennis Allen was a defensive coordinator in the Sean Payton era in New Orleans, and a very good defensive coordinator. So it's going to be a more defensive-focused team than it was in the past with the New Orleans Saints, often known as a very offensive-minded franchise in the Drew Brees era with Alvin Kamara, with, uh, you know, Michael Thomas, but of course other players many years before that I'm now blanking on, uh, going uh, Reggie Bush and such, when they won the Super Bowl and, and all that, and I terribly sorry for bringing up those awful memories of the 2009 NFC title game, but very talented team, and they remained talented uh, many years after that, and they, were, and they were talented before that, but that was the big jump year for New Orleans. Taysom Hill missed a, uh, was kind of in and out, didn't really factor a whole lot in this game. You got to see all kinds of names, like obviously Jordan Addison, some big plays, unfortunately. Uh, didn't, didn't make every catch, obviously was out of bounds on one 69 yards and four catches for him. No touchdowns. But TJ Hawkinson did get a receiving touchdown from Josh Dobbs, and he was a huge stud in the game. Uh, Hawkins, the, the Hawkinson and Joshua Dobbs connection has been pretty impressive thus far, but uh, it became more of a defensive battle in the second half, kind of. But then again, as the Vikings' offense continued to sputter and the Saints' offense continued to uh, mount comebacks, obviously with Derek Carr going out with what looked like maybe a whiplash and maybe a neck injury, type of a situation there, so hopefully Derek Carr will be okay. Um, Jameis Winston took over and showed his arm, showed his his ability, not so much his mobility, as he had no rushing yards in the game, but definitely showed his arm, Jameis Winston. Um, But then later on in the game, started showing the careless, uh, you know, swashbuckling, ah, what the hell, backyard football uh, interceptions late in the game that ended up costing the Reeling Saints down the stretch, which is why he has 100 career interceptions now, if I remember correctly. Yes, that is why it was his 100th interception on that play. It feels like it should be a lot more, but Tamis Winston has become a backup quarterback, going from a number one overall pick with the Bucks, Tampa Bay Bucks, 
years ago. Uh, Chris Olave had a huge play in a game that was all over the ESPN highlight reel and such, and very frustrating um, <laughs> as uh, Byron Murphy Jr. got burned on that one. Uh, had some huge moments did Byron Murphy Jr., and we appreciate what he was able to accomplish. Unfortunately, again, also ran into some, uh, obviously had that key interception that helped wrap the game up, but also some um, very frustrating uh, moments like that one. Byron Murphy, he's, he's, he's had an up-and-down run with the Vikings, but the last couple of weeks, I'd say he's generally been pretty good. Uh, all of us, this was kind of a game of names that you didn't always hear as much but also, a name that you did hear quite a bit is Ivan Pace Jr. He had a really nice open field tackle along the way in the game. Obviously, very impressive uh, in his five total tackles. Josh Metellus was all over the place. Multiple quarterback hits, tackle for a loss, uh, seven total tackles. Josh Metellus, one of the best players in the game. Jordan Hicks missed a little bit of time. Looked a little scary for a minute, but was able to get back in there, thankfully. So Jordan, Jordan Hicks tied with uh, Josh Metellus for the team lead in total tackles. Solo tackles, overall lead going for Josh Metellus as he had another really, really strong performance. You even got to see Jonathan Bullard get a sack for the first time since his days with Arizona. And you got to see Daniel Hunter get his 11th sack of the season. And DJ Wanoff also threw in another one. Three sacks along the way. Daniel Hunter, again, one of the best players in the league right now. Detroit still needs to play their game. And obviously they had a bye week, I believe, last week, if I remember correctly. Um, so that's why they have a le- uh, they have less games. The Vikings bye week is very late this season, which I guess kind of is what it is. <sighs> it's frustrating, kind of a scary second half. The New Orleans Saints would mount multiple. Uh, they would get a field goal very early in the game to tie it up after the Vikings were up three nothing, but um, they would get two touchdowns and two 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 point conversions, so sixteen points and two touchdowns for the Saints. So that's why you get the odd score of twenty seven nineteen. Uh, Alvin Kamara up the middle twice for two two-point conversions. Um, but yeah, you got to hear names that you don't hear all the time, like Kene Nwangwu. Uh, Brandon Powell obviously was a huge factor last week. He was a hero last week. Still pretty good this week in a couple of big plays. Uh, Jalen Naylor with a 16-yard catch. Johnny Munt, a couple catches. Usually he's, he's able to squeeze in one somewhere. Uh, one six-yard catch for Alexander Madison, but it was an important one, thankfully. Um... Yep, Derek Carr did fumble, but didn't lose the ball. It was a potential scri- uh, strip sack, but it didn't happen at the end of the day. Uh, Taysom Hill also, I believe, was in a play that was a strip sack, but didn't. Uh, but it was recovered by the Saints, so it didn't officially count as a turnover because it wasn't. It was recovered. So uh, Rashid Shahid, Shashid, that's the name I've been having fun with the last few weeks. Rashid, Shashid, Shashid, Superseed. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, 27 yards average on two returns impressive obviously very impressive Rashid Shashid on kick returns luckily though um, for the most part except for his final punt Ryan Wright was incredible in his punting and he had to be uh, Lou Hedley as well had six punts gosh that's a lot six punts but he had a touchback where Ryan Wright had a Pro Bowl level day except for his very final punt which was not a very good one it was like less than 30 yards. One up with a 43-yard average because of that. But three of his punts, him being Ryan Wright in the 20, along of 50, which isn't great, but it's good, and zero touchbacks. Ryan Wright, so we're getting to the Ryan Wright card with that. Uh, poor decision made on fourth and three. Um, probably the worst move of kind of, yeah, the worst move of the day by Kevin O'Connell by far. Like an urban legend. Like, why do we keep trying to force a square peg through a round hole? Greg Joseph has the leg, Greg the leg and everything, but he's not the most accurate kicker. He's just not. He can be clutch at times, but you just knew it, it, it had that Gary Anderson vibe to it. The Vikings had a decent lead at the time, a multi-score lead, but you knew, see, if he makes the kick, the game's kind of sort of over, kind of sort of over, like sort of, you know what I mean? But if he misses, it's like now the Saints get the ball at the 45-yard line. That's great. They get the ball at the 45-yard line. Great. So, why not just freaking go for it instead of attempt a 54-yard field goal and miss? So that didn't work out too good, and it was extremely frustrating, but at least Greg, the quote-unquote leg, did make his other two attempts along a 40, and three extra points all went through, so thank you there. Not much of a return game for the Vikings at all. For the most part, in fact, zero kick returns, which is interesting. They were all touchbacks by the uh, 
a New Orleans kicker, Blake Gruppe, who made a 48-yarder in the game early on. Um, yeah, zero extra points because they were all two-point conversions. <clears throat> kind of ironic and all that, but yeah, Brandon Powell, just 12 yards and two catches, two uh, uh, kick punt returns, pardon me. Um, so that's your special teams update. You could say Najee Thompson was maybe the better, one of the better special teams tackles of the season. That was a big one where it could have been a huge problem, but thankfully Thompson was able to get Rashid Shashid in a punt return. That could have been a huge problem as, uh, gosh, I mean, the Saints could have had a huge return, and that could have made things very interesting. He was able to, him being um, um, uh, Thompson, Najee, Najee Thompson, not Davenport, <laughs> was able to get Rashid Shashid, creep him up a little bit at the last second, and to prevent a huge return in a situation where the Saints might have tied the game up after that, but luckily, Jameis Winston got reckless, and uh, well, it's Jameis Winston, that's the reason why he's not really panned out as a superstar that he could have been because of his recklessness. Um, just like stealing crabs. Okay, sorry. But no, en enough of the crab stuff. That was kind of tiring and lame. The Saints remain in first place because Atlanta's 4-5 and five at the moment. So we'll see how that turns out. Tampa Bay's 4-5 and five and they... Did they win today? I thought... Th I, th I think they did. I, I saw their score and Detroit is leading. So Vikings actually... There's an interest with Detroit now. That wasn't there before because we both have six wins. The Vikings have caught the Lions in the win column, but unfortunately we're still leading in the L column. So, lost column, L column, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we'll get more into that in segment number two. The Vikings will be playing the Denver Broncos next week on Sunday Night Football, which is one of my least favorite things, but uh, it's okay. Monday Night's actually probably the worst, but uh, yeah, because it's kind of like, you know, it's, the show won't even come out until Tuesday or Wednesday in that situation. Or Sunday night, maybe I can work on the first segment, depending on how late the game ends. I can maybe squeeze in the first segment and then continue the rest of the game, uh, or the rest of the show, podcast, into, um, you know, Monday morning, depending on what the weather's like. I'm not sure, unfortunately, because it's stupid lawn cleanup season. I'll find a way. It might be Monday night when I'm finally able to record and release the final two segments of next week's episode. So, yeah, Kenny Nwongwa was actually active. Uh, Lewis Dean has been inactive pretty much the whole damn season because he's not good. Um, yeah, it's really frustrating. I, I can't believe the Minnesota Wild are 5, 7, and 2. God, that's bad. But then again, they're, I don't know. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. They've been in cap hell for the last few years, and it's, it's starting to, you know, <laughs> starting to rear its ugly head. Uh... I don't know. It's just that second half was it was kind of frustrating. It was kind of scary. The Saints are better than a lot of people think. And, and some, some people, though I, other people have the opinion that the Saints are far inferior to their record. I, I, think, I think it's a pretty decent team. And I, and I like Dennis Allen. I think he's a good, solid coach, uh, defensive-minded. And I think, well, you know, I mean, it's okay. It's, it's good to have a good defense. Obviously, you have Cam Jordan, Cameron Jordan, the son of Steve Jordan, of course. As uh, we always talk about Steve Jordan, when you hear Cam Jordan, who's a star defensive end for the New Orleans Saints. Kind of is what it is. You know, <laughs> it's unfortunate that he's on one of those teams and he was in that big playoff game against us in the Miracle uh, back in 2017. We, of course, that episode is, still exists. And of course, uh, yes, I was covering the Vikings then on Purple Mafia. Um, I'm kind of getting off topic here, though, but uh, kind of, sort of. Still some Vikings and Saints related. I don't know. It was such a fun first half. And the, the, the second half just kind of took all the energy out of the building, damn it. It, it kind of did. It's just, it's a nice feeling that the Vikings were able to hang on. That's the good part. Uh, Makai Blackman, huge interception, which uh, kind of sort of wrapped the game up. Of course, the Vikings had to force, um, make sure, obviously make sure that there was an incomplete pass along the way to wrap things up with the Saints. And obviously, you know, burn the clock as much as we could along the way as well. Um, but, yeah, not going for it on the 45, that, that was a mistake. It, it really was. Just w why give the Saints the ball, basically, in midfield? Just go for it. And, again, if you fail, it is what it is. But if you get it, it's it's big. It's a big momentum. The Vikings offense was doing all right at the time. And then that kick, the, the missed kick and all that, just kind of, it just took the energy out of the building. As the energy was already kind of leaving the building at the time, clearly the momentum was starting to kind of, swing, the pendulum was swinging towards New Orleans, 
and then you you miss the kick, and then it's like, okay, that pendulum is swinging very hard in the other direction. Um, luckily, the Vikings were able to get at least one field goal in the uh, second half. If not for that, we might have really been in trouble. But then again, no, the Saints either way would have had to score a touchdown to even, you know, to not lose the game, basically. They would have won with the touchdown, but it's also in order to not lose. Like, there was no way to tie the game with a five-point game either. So there's that. Um, Ty Chandler, yeah, I mean, he wasn't spectacular. And, of course, in those in those uh, series where the Vikings were hoping, maybe, maybe hoping to get a first down on a run, didn't seem to be able to get there. But, of course, again, the Saints defense deserves more credit than people might give it. This isn't the Saints of old where they would throw for, you know, throw and run for 500 yards, but also give up 480 yards and win 38 to 35. Those days are over. Um, it's more of a Zimmer-like, but more modern, I guess you could say, with Dennis Allen, a more modern Zimmer, where he's not, you know, he's not super, you know, like, I don't know, dinosaur-like, which Zimmer had become, unfortunately. So there's that. And Carr is a decent quarterback. He's not great, but he's decent. Winston's insanely talented, but he's too reckless. And that's what's definitely come back to haunt the New Orleans Saints over the years. Um, it's again, ur urban legend number two, other than not going for it on that fourth and three and then midfield that ended up hurting us. Um, the other urban legend I have to say is a guy with as much talent as Jameis Winston, why he has to be so damn reckless. I mean, that is a urban legend if I've ever seen one because it's like, what's the deal? Why can't you be better? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Marco Rossi, second line. I like that. Rossi. Rossi. Marco Rossi. Minnesota Wild. Sorry. Um, yeah. Why can't he be less, uh, slightly less reckless, mature a little bit, and then maybe, just maybe, James Winston could be in the Pro Bowl for many years. Um, but unfortunately, it's just that's who he is, I guess. That's who he wants to be. So that sucks. Uh, Joshua Dobbs, to me, I think he's starting quarterback material in the NFL. Um I think he's on the he's on the cusp of being a starting quarterback in the NFL. Um, obviously, he was far inferior in the second half, but it seemed like the whole approach was much more conservative in the second half as well because you figure, oh, we're up by this huge amount of points. We just need to be careful now, run the clock down, and try not to turn the ball over, which luckily the Vikings did not. So credit to Dobbs and, uh, you know, the, the running backs as well that, the, uh, that there weren't turnovers. Um, almost a turnover on, <laughs> almost a huge turnover late in the game, but ended up uh, favoring the Saints. I believe that was the Michael Thomas play, I believe. The nine-yard play, yeah, which was kind of funny how it was ruled an incomplete pass rather than a fumble, right? An incomplete pass rather than a fumble. Instead, it was ruled a complete pass, but the guy was down, so they got a little more yardage. It was kind of funny. So it's like, yeah, yeah, you were right about the challenge, but the Saints do keep the ball, and because he was already down, and they get more, and they get a few yards out of it. It was kind of funny. That's uh, that's a funny one. That's <laughs> I, I don't know. That could be another urban legend. Like, how many times has that happened? <laughs> you challenge, you challenge, you're successful, and it's kind of like not good, you know. It's kind of not a good thing. <laughs> it actually kind of helped the other team. You're successful, though. Congratulations. You were successful. The challenge it was completed, but um, no, he was down. He was still down after the catch rather than it being an incomplete pass. So we weren't charged a timeout. All right, so at least there's that. That was just funny. <laughs> I like that one. That's a new one for me. Um, with that said, though, I might as well uh, jump into the... Uh, Awards and demerits for the week. The Fran Tarkington Award for this week. Could it be the second time for this guy? I mean, could it be Makai Blackman again? I really like Makai Blackman, if you haven't noticed. I'm becoming a huge fan. Uh, again, only two tackles in the game because he's deflecting passes. I think he's a shutdown corner, and he's just a rookie. Uh, this guy, Makai Blackman, is going to be a stud in this league, I think, for years. I mean, I'm really impressed. He might be the best cornerback on the Vikings already. And not many people are talking about him a whole lot. That's the funny part. Murphy Jr. was kind of the big name, the young the young veteran that came in, and he's had a kind of a rough year. But then you have people like Makai Blackman, rookie. That's a that's a draft pick that could keep Kwesi 
you know, Cam, <laughs> Quasi Andolfo Mensa, employed for a long time. Draft picks like Mackay Blackman might end up keeping him employed with the Minnesota Vikings for an extended period. Multiple pass deflections. Now, Byron Murphy had three of them, so let's give him credit as well. It's just unfortunate he got burned on a miracle, miracle-like play. Andrew Booth Jr. is becoming better, but um, I've loved the progress of Mackay Blackman's career. Um, I'm going to have him share it with Josh Metellus. I thought he was wonderful as well. Metellus had a massive game. Massive. But Mackay Blackman's going to share with Josh Metellus as we head into the Christmas season and all that. So we're in the season of giving, kind of. It's like the pre-Christmas season, you can call it. Uh, by people already starting with the decorations. And I will not be one of those people that's going to say, No! I'm going to say, Yes, go ahead. If it's after Halloween, go ahead. If it's before Halloween, that's kind of weird. That's getting weird. <laughs> not that I'm a huge Halloween fan, but at the same time, it's kind of weird if you're putting up Christmas decorations before Halloween. Um, the uh, the um, Christian Potter Memorial, I don't think there's a huge obvious, like, sucky game for anybody in this one, other than it's just, why did the offense have to completely die in the second half? Um, and it had to go to, to a defensive player. Uh, Hawkinson is a strong honorable mention. In fact, he should have it almost running away, the Fran Tarkington Award. He almost should. Almost. Um, I don't know. Uh, luckily, nobody had an Achilles tendon again. I almost wanted to give that to the just Achilles tendon tendon in general. Like, what the heck? Like, that that could have been the Christian Potter Memorial last week. I don't know. I, I'm not really mad at anybody in this game. Maybe I'm just crazy and stupid, other than this costly, stupid penalties. Should I give it to... The, it was a huge play that could have been a touchdown by Ty Chandler, which would have iced the game. I'm going to give a Christian Potter Memorial to a player that I would never think I'd ever give it to. I It's going to hurt a lot to do. I have, to, I have to do it because it pissed me off so much because the game would have been over. It, it would have been over. It was just such an unnecessary thing. Oh, boy. Please, please forgive me. Brian O'Neill. Oh, Brian O'Neill for that stupid uh, holding or illegal block or whatever it was. It was a hold, but it looked like we're like an illegal block in a way. But just, like, damn it anyway, you know. Did that, did that have to happen? And I know maybe Chandler wouldn't have had the touchdown anyway had uh, the block never happened, the illegal block or the, uh, you know, the the holding. But at the same time, you know, that, it was so stinking frustrating to see such a, you know, huge play that could have pretty much put the game on ice end up the way it did because of that stupid penalty. So, sorry. And apparently he does lead the Vikings in penalties this year. So I think, yep, he should get a little slap on the wrist. There you go. Okay, Brian O'Neill. Now be good. Be as good as you be as good as you normally are, and hopefully it's the last time you'll hear your name after a Christian Potter Memorial. With that said, we're going to take a quick break and return for uh, segment number two and watching some Sunday night football and uh, getting ready for Sunday night football next week. So next week it could have been like the second segment or watching the Vikings live, but unfortunately it's not going to work that way. Even though I'm freaking tempted to do that, that'd be kind of funny. And we are back here on Purple Mafia, segment number two. Instead of a football game flashing on the screen, I have the Timberwolves flashing on the screen against the hated, annoying, over-showboating Golden State Warriors. I hope the Wolves crush them into the next county, but, you know, oftentimes, unfortunately, these don't always go our way. It's annoying, <laughs> really annoying to watch, but we'll see. I'll be switching around between this and the NFL. Let's see, what is it, the Jets and the Raiders? Well, uh, Jets and Raiders... And then the Timberwolves are wearing their very classic uh, jerseys. I love that. Uh, looks like Jets and Raiders is 3-3 three to three with, see the Jets, what is it, uh, still that Nick, there, yeah, it's that Wilson quarterback. Yeah, it's Wilson. He's exciting stuff. Uh, I'm going to click on it just for fun here. The Raiders, I almost forgot. Zach Wilson, that's right, not Nick. Oh, yeah, and Aiden O'Connell, no relation to 
Kevin O'Connell that I know about. Dalvin Cook with a run for seven yards. All right. Well, that's progress for Dalvin Cook anyway. Um, yes, the Vikings will be playing the Broncos next week. They are on the bye, so I might have to dip back into last week's game. And I will continue. I will absolutely continue to say the New York Jets have the best helmet in the NFL. They do. I'm looking, man, do they have a close-up on that thing right now as they're zooming in on Nick Wilson's face for some reason. I keep calling him Nick, Zach Wilson. Might as well call him Nick, because who the heck is Zach Wilson in this day and age, right? No, uh, Wilson to Wilson. Cool. And those are gorgeous helmets. Gorgeous. Um, and if you disagree with me, you're free to uh, do so. Uh, and tell me, gosh, those are ugly. But I love them. Colts versus Patriots, and of course the Thursday night game involves the Chicago Bears, so that's going to have to be later, and I continue to make the same dumb mistake every week, because that's just how I am. I don't understand simple stuff sometimes. Actually, I do, but uh, I don't know. I fixed it. Okay, <laughs> Colts Gardner Minshew with an interception and under 200 yards. Mac Daddy Jones with an interception. Bailey Zapp with an interception for the Patriotas in a 10-6 to victory for the Indianapolis Colts. Is there anything more I need to say? Jonathan Taylor was bell cowish. 23 carries, 69 yards, 3 yards a carry with a long of 10. Wow. Sounds like Dalvin Cook last year. Next year, Jonathan Taylor will probably get even less yards and will be making that big money. Sounds about right. Um, yeah, he did get in the end zone once, and that was the difference maker for the game, to be quite honest. Zeke Elliott, that guy, yep, actually did, did a little better. 4.2 for the Patriotas and Ramade Stevenson also with 88 yards on 20 carries. Good. Good running game for the Patriots. Almost five yards a carry. But uh, the Colts a little better. Despite the interception by Garter Minshew, he was yeah, okay. He was okay. And Mac Jones did complete 75% of his passes, but something went awry there and the Patriots are now 2-8. and eight. So it's kind of time to, I don't know, We'll see what happens with Belichick and the Patriots. If they fire Belichick, I, I, I don't know. It just shows further and further proof. It doesn't matter what your history is. It's just NFL, not for long uh, throughout the NFL. Some flags flying around. Interesting, but that's just holding. Big deal. Cincinnati, impressive wins the last few weeks. They'd won a, a number of games in a row. And now they lose to the Texans, who are 5-4 and four and technically would have a home or well, would have a tiebreaker over the Cincinnati Bengals. Who saw that? I'm not sure, but Joe Burrow throwing multiple interceptions doesn't help. A couple of touchdowns, but a couple of interceptions. Kind of like his predecessor, about a couple quarterbacks back now in Cincinnati. Carson Palmer, as good as he was. Um, yep. Eventually replaced by the Red Rifle, and then so on and so forth. Red Rifle, yep. And then eventually finally got to be Joe Burrow. Two touchdowns, two interceptions, 347 yards. But those interceptions certainly didn't help. C.J. Stroud with one touchdown and one interception, but also threw for 356 yards. And then uh, Devin Singletary also with 150 yards and 30 carries. 30 carries by the Houston Texans. And it's five yards a carry. So it's one of those, they just kind of ran, ran him into the ground, basically, is what the uh, Houston Texans did. And they wore out that uh, Cincinnati defense. Not to mention the thought, uh, not to mention that Noah Brown had a 172 yards and just 7 catches but 0 TDs. Tank Dell got in the end zone for Houston with 56 yards on 6 catches. Jamar Chase, spectacular game again. 5 catches, 124 for a TD. Uh, Trenton Irwin also a touchdown on 54 yards but Tyler Boyd 117 yards but no TDs. I know it's kind of a bit of back and forth but Cincinnati was a flipping mess. God, but they also um, recovered three fumbles in the game to Cincinnati, so it was just a turnover fest. Again, multiple INTs by uh, Joe Burrow certainly didn't help, but um, no fumbles actually lost by Cincinnati, where C.J. Stroud fumbled twice, twice, fumbled and lost the ball twice, and then had that single INT, so three turnovers for C.J. Stroud. He certainly wasn't the best player for Houston. Sheldon Rankins definitely wreaked havoc on the uh, on Joe Burrow with uh, three sacks, and Houston's out of Houston's four. Yep, so Houston just kind of, again, attacking Joe Burrow and get it, forcing the INTs along the way, despite the fact C.J. Stroud was turning the ball over like a madman. The Houston Texans, five and four. Interesting. They're kind of like the Vikings of the uh, AFC. A lot of people 
with, well, you know, I mean, the Vikings had high expectations coming in the year, but once we were 1-4, and four, we had no expectations. It was like, yeah, whatever. Get that draft pick. Keep on losing. What the hell? Hello, Johnny Menzel. Yeah, that song. Um, rematch of the Packers and Steelers Super Bowl. We'll get back to that later. S- different result. Anyhow, Tampa Bay schmucks over the Tennessee midgets. They're not Titans. They're midgets. They suck. Uh, they're 0-5 on the road. Are the Titans 3-6 and six overall? 6 bleeping points against Tampa. 20-6 to six win. And the Bucks staying alive. Staying alive. They've already lost three home games. That sounds familiar. It really does. And then, old, and then of course, the peanut butter and jelly dropped on Baker Mayfield, but at least he threw for two touchdowns. Will Levis with an INT. Definitely uh, the magic, the sugar high of his first game has definitely disappeared into the night. There's no doubt about that. Derrick Henry on 11 carries. Are you ready? Are you ready? 11 carries, right? 24 yards. Spectacular. Um, yeah, Tampa Bay's defense showed up to play a bit when it comes to that. Mike Evans also showed up to play for Tampa, 143 yards. Might think that Tom Brady's hurling the ball again during the Super Bowl champion season of 2020. Mike Evans, big numbers like that during that year. And that was a fun year. No matter what you think of Brady and the Bucks and blah, 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 blah I loved it. I'm sorry. I like Tom Brady. Sorry. I, I still do. And if he came back and played well and won another Super Bowl, you know what? I wouldn't mind it. I don't like the Kansas City Chiefs because they, they they don't handle with grace as, as much as, say, the Patriots did. I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it's just a different vibe. I don't know. Something about the Chiefs just bugs me, man. They just bug me. Their personality bugs me. But Tampa, or at least Tom Brady anyway, it, he bugged some people. But for me, it just he didn't. I don't know. He just didn't bug me. I don't know what it is. The Brown Bowl, and it was a good game. It was a really, really good game, considering how good the Baltimore Ravens are. A lot of people, actually, there were a few people that were ranking them number one in the NFL, the best team in the world, over the Eagles and Chiefs, which is fine if it's over the Chiefs. Eagles, well, it's a, I would not mind a Baltimore-Philly Super Bowl. That'd be kind of fun to watch, actually. It still might happen. But the Cleveland Browns win the Brown Bowl. Sounds disgusting, but they win the Brown Bowl. <laughs> With their second road win of the year, and in Baltimore of all places, Baltimore has lost two games at home for some reason. I'm not sure why. But uh, Cleveland, that 16-point fourth quarter, really carried them, and what an amazing job. A couple of INTs by Lamar Jackson. As good as Lamar Jackson is, sometimes he's not that good, and it's annoying. It It's really annoying. Um, Deshaun Watson, one touchdown, one interception. i got to think both defenses were huge factors, and they had to have been. Obviously, the running game as well. Somebody named Jerome Ford emerging nicely with <laughs> Cleveland. Yep, Jerome Ford's really emerging in a good way. Kareem Hunt definitely is showing his age a bit. 10 carries and 32 yards. Yay. Lamar Jackson and Baltimore couldn't really run worth a Dickens. Lamar Jackson ran decent. 5.1 yards a carry on 41 total yards. But, um, I don't know. They just didn't run a whole lot. And Cleveland kind of... Uh, Kept him running the ball, 178 yards, and but just under five yards a carry. Extremely impressive with their running game. Amari Cooper with 98 yards receiving. Zay Flowers with 73 for Baltimore. Sacks all over the place. Cleveland only had three, but it's like they're shared. That's kind of weird. Baltimore had four sacks, two of them to a guy named Jadavian Clowney. Remember that name? Big, big name, of course. couple of sacks for Baltimore. One and a half for the other big-time star, Miles Garrett of the Cleveland Browns, who are the real Cleveland Browns. They beat Baltimore, who they are, of course, the former Cleveland Browns, and it's amazing how the city of Baltimore is a part of multiple uh, teams moving. The Colts leaving Baltimore, and the Ravens moving to Baltimore as the original Cleveland Browns left years ago. 33-31, to an amazing victory for the Cleveland Browns, who are now 6-3. and three. That's right. The Cleveland Browns just might do something this year. They just might have a magical season in the cards. We shall see how this continues, but uh, an extremely, extremely impressive and a statement win for the Cleveland Browns. And in case you're listening, Vinrock Vince Germano coming in out of Melbourne, Australia. Congratulations. This, this must have felt good. I mean, this must have felt good. Must have felt really good beating the other purple team in the NFL called the Baltimore Ravens, Ravens, San Francisco, 
They'd lost three games in a row after us. You know, yes, they'd lost three games in a row after a 5-0 and start. Looked like an awesome team. Looked like a bunch of butt kickers whooping some you-know-what all over the place. And then they lost three in a row, including one of them to us. What did they lose to Cleveland? Who's, that was right about when Cleveland started showing some really encouraging signs. And then they lose to Cincinnati, who had been getting their head out of somewhere because they started terrible for the second year in a row, kind of like us this year. Yeah, and we got our heads out of somewhere, at least kind of. Second half, it kind of went right back up that area, though. Um, I digress. Jacksonville Jaguars destroyed by the San Francisco 49ers who were who did a Bobby Knight uh, saying, I'm sick and tired of losing and cursing and calling everybody names and I'm sick of this and sick of that and F, 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 F. And uh, Brock Purdy. Yeah, Brock Purdy taken out of the game because the 49ers were killing uh, the Jaguars. So it's like Sam Darnold got to uh, attempt a couple passes and did a bunch of handoffs. But Brock Purdy, 148.9 quarterback rating, three touchdowns, no INTs. Brock Purdy looking like Brock Purdy. Trevor Lawrence with a couple of INTs, no touchdowns. And C.J. Beathard, the former San Francisco 49er, came in also to prevent injury to Trevor Lawrence and so on and so forth. But Jacksonville pounded in, in their house. And they've lost three home games already this year. And every game they have lost was at home. So Jacksonville, it's our ro- the Jacksonville Jaguars are road warriors, kind of like the Texas Rangers. We'll see if uh, that continues. Never heard of that before. I still can't believe it as we're going to digress to the Texas Rangers here for a split second. The Texas Rangers were undefeated on the road during their World Series run. Wrap your head around that. Undefeated on the road and wrote to their World Series victory. That, that just doesn't happen. The Twins... In 1987, were undefeated at home. Extremely impressive, especially the fact that the Twins were by far the biggest underdog in that playoffs. Back in 1987, uh, 91, the Twins did lose one home game. That was Game Two to Toronto, but were undefeated, eight and zero all time in the World Series. Awesome, but to be like say undefeated on the road, especially in the, in the age when you had to play in the wild card, which Texas did. They didn't have the first round by. Oh, baseball's adopted that whole first round by thing. I think it's kind of cool. It's just like football now, but with series. Um, I still can't believe Texas was undefeated on the road. That's, uh, and I wasn't cheering for them. I wanted Arizona, damn it. Of course they didn't win. <sighs> Poor Arizona. Uh, George Kittle with three catches and 116 yards. Damn. One of them was 66 yards, a touchdown. Ayuk, Ayuk was on fire. Three catches also with a touchdown and 55 yards. Christian McCaffrey is in the house with 95 yards on 16 carries. Debo Samuel has returned, but not great numbers. Total yardage for him was, what, 59 total yards. So nothing sexy, but at least he's back, and he's going to get better and better again. Anthony Jr., 35 yards and only 9 carries, but let's see. Let, let's see. Jacksonville was, was getting their butts kicked the whole game, so they didn't run a whole lot as the game progressed. Them being Jacksonville, Javon Hargrove, and Nick Bosa also uh, combined for a total of three sacks, 1.5 apiece. Five total sacks for San Francisco. And Jacksonville was sicko at home. They've sucked at home this year. That's just all you got to say about that. Over three, or not over three, but two and three at home. Ooh, wee, that's not real good. It's not good stuff, but kind of nice to see San Francisco kind of back in the swing of things. And the thing, after Jacksonville lost today, they have six wins. So that tells you what kind of year Jacksonville's having, which is pretty good. <laughs> and then it's the Battle of the Birds, the Red Birds, the Falcons, and the Cardinals. The Cardinals beat the Falcons. Oh, my God. What a rebound that is. We were all making fun of the Cardinals last week, who couldn't muster a point. I mean, they sucked so much, you know what. They sucked so bad last week. They got shut out, and they were awful, and... What's his name through for, you know, the quarterback of the uh, car? Oh, Kyler Murray's playing. Okay, that helps. But the uh, other quarterback for Arizona threw for like 58 yards, was it? It was freaking terrible. Quarterback rating was like minus. <laughs> it might as well have been. And uh, we were making fun of him having Josh Dobbs come in after fumbling twice, but then was awesome after that. Looked like, you know, God knows who he looked like Mahomes or something. Um, after the, not quite that good, but looked really good. Um, and then uh, the Vikings pull off a nice comeback victory over Atlanta on the road. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, Arizona beats Atlanta now in Arizona. So it's a little different. A little different confines there. The all-red Cardinals 
Um, Kyler Murray actually ran, ran the ball into the end zone once. Good for him. And the Cardinals defeat the Helena Falcons 25-23. to So, all right. Kyler Murray finally playing again. He put the he put the PS5, 6, PS6, PS7 controller down. I don't even care what it is. The Switch. The, what, what's the other system? Xbox 19. I'm just kidding. Xbox One, I guess it still is. I'm not into the modern stuff. I'm a retro gamer, damn it. Video game flashback. Check out that podcast. <gasps> see what I did there? See what I did? Gray McBride. Also see what he did. Eight catches, 131 yards in the air for Arizona. Despite Kyler Murray with his usual peanut butter and jelly stain on his shirt because he can't play a game without throwing an interception or fumbling. But still, at least, you know, at least, hey, it gave him some spark and they won a game. All right. And let's not forget, Kyler Murray was the number one overall pick in the draft a few years ago. Yeah, fun reminder, isn't it? Taylor Heineke, 55 yards. That's right, 55 yards, but at least he threw for a touchdown. Desmond Ritter, you ready? 39 yards. Awesome. Epic. But at least Bajon Robinson ran for 95 and a touchdown. So congratulations, Bajon Robinson with the Jamal Anderson Award, if that's who you could consider as the greatest Falcon of all time. I'm not sure, but he's, he's up there. Uh, greatest Falcon running back, I would have to say. 95 yards on the ground. It's a good game. But um, Arizona finally won again. Good for them, I guess. Kyler Murray's definitely not a number one overall pick, though. And he's getting paid a billion dollars. Welcome to sports. Oh, the Jets. The Jets. The Jets are on fire. They've now made their second field goal. Isn't that great? Awesome, man. Epic. It's freaking great. Uh, Lions and Chargers. Ooh, epic battle, but we'll come back to that later. Cowboys and Giants. What more is there to say? It's kind of like reminding you of that in the 90s. Early 90s. Okay, no, the Giants were still decent. They were at least a comp- semi-competitive team, but Dallas won every bleeping time they played, and I hated it, and I think most people did too. I'm not this huge New York Giants fan, but if it's Giants and Cowboys... I'm going to pick, you know, I'm going to be on the Giants' sideline every single time these teams play. Unless the Giants are found to be like this big, horrible, cheating franchise. Okay, maybe they were for a second when uh, Jim, uh, what, what was that guy's name? That jackass who was the head coach in 2000 and they beat us 41 nothing. but eh, 41 nothing. I don't know. I, no matter how much cheating they did <laughs> with the calls, you still, there's no excuse to get beat, beat 41 nothing. Dak Prescott and the Cowboys went 49 to 17. Is there anything else you need to know? Okay, Prescott threw for 400 yards and four touchdowns, and of course he had an interception because he can't control himself. He just can't. I'm just kidding. I know. My God, Brandon Cooks actually had more yards than C.D. Lamb in the game, didn't he? I didn't even realize that. I, wow. Well, because you know when you're watching a game like that, kind of in the background, you're faint interest. It's like, who cares? It's like 99 to nothing. And then the Giants finally score a couple of points in the fourth quarter. Congratulations, guys. Ten points in the fourth quarter. There you go. 49-17. Brandon Cooks had nine catches with one touchdown. 173 yards. CeeDee Lamb, his last five games have been like 150-plus. It's unbelievable. Maybe not quite that high, but it's been high. We'll check it out in a second. It's been great. 11 catches, 151 yards, and a touchdown. I'm going to look at C.D. Lamb's a game log if I can possibly do that. It's freaking crazy, man. It's freaking stupid. It's it's only four games in a row? I thought it was more than that, but against the Chargers on October 16th, seven catches, 117 yards. Against the Los Angeles Rams, the other L.A. team, uh, 14 catch, no, 12 catches, 158 yards. Oh, is that all? Against the Eagles, yep, the Eagles beat them. Ha ha. Uh, 11 catches, 191 yards, but no touchdowns, so there you go. And then against the Giants today, one touchdown, 11 catches, 151 yards. So, great run by C.D. Lamb. Does it have his total statistics for the season? I wonder if it's all been added up properly. I'm, my God, he's just under 1,000 yards already. It's freaking crazy. <laughs> it's pretty good, actually. Well done, C.D., well done. Very well done indeed. I mean, that's impressive. What sucks is he's only got three touchdowns, or maybe four if you count today's, or if, if today's was not counted yet. That's kind of weird. Almost a thousand yards. 
He's projected to get 1,751, and I do think that was before today's game. It's crazy, man. Crazy, 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 crazy. Yep, C.D. Lamb, good job. We'll keep moving now. Let's get off of this. Yeah, the Cowboys won comfortably, and the Giants are just awful. And it's kind of sad. But they still beat us in the playoffs, though, with that stupid quarterback. Isn't that dumb? God. Still, uh, still, man, that still sticks on my mind. And how can it not? It's really dumb. How do you freaking lose to that freaking team? How? Seahawks and the Commanders. Mr. Data, Sam Howell. Nice game, man. The Washington loses. That sucks. Washington loses in uh, Washington State. Seattle Seahawks are 6-3. and three. Nice record, actually. 4-1 and one at home. Geno Smith with a couple of TDs, and he did not have an interception. 360. Now, what an epic football game. This is nice. Nice stuff. Nice. That's what well quarterback game, but it's, and it's not like this, you know, forty-seven to you know fifty-two to forty-seven final score. That's not, that's dumb. It's like okay, play some defense. My God, see this is like reasonable. Twenty-nine to twenty-six. It's a good football game. Like you want to sit down and watch a game of football. This is good stuff. No interceptions by Geno Smith. No interceptions by Sam Howell. Three hundred and twelve yards. Three touchdowns. Both of them have quarterback ratings in, in the in the in the, in the hundreds. Pretty good. Pretty good. You know, decent running game, too. I mean, kind of... Um, they didn't run as much. Washington only ran the ball 14 times. That's funny, but five yards a carry. Seattle ran the ball 26 times. Kenneth Walker, the third, 63 yards, respectively. Not great numbers, but 4.6 overall as a team. Cool. Um, and Rob or Brian Robinson Jr., though, didn't run for a whole lot, but he received a, the catch-and-go... <laughs> Type of thing. Sorry. Mm, I'm sneezing or something. 119 yards and six catches. That's insanely impressive. Brian Robinson Jr. Good job, man. <laughs> DK Metcalf, 98 yards. Tyler Lockett, 92. Seven catches for DK and eight for Tyler Lockett. But uh, a very nice football game, honestly. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, you know, reasonably good defense. Reasonable, but really, really solid offense really efficient passing game i mean that, it's fun to watch it's fun to watch that kind of thing defense is good but sometimes a little offense is good too uh monday night football bills and broncos so our next week's opponent so they yeah the broncos were not on the bye they're playing on monday so that's good for us in a sense we don't play till sunday night and oh well, yeah you know we play today so they have one less day of rest do the denver broncos the week playing in buffalo People were talking about the Broncos are on the bye. No, they're Monday Night Football versus the Bills. Must win game for the Buffalo Bills, I think, if they want to, like, they need to stop screwing around. Five and four, Buffalo? What is going on? What's going on? Yeah, and there was an ugly game last week, if I remember correctly for them. It was bad. Really, really, really bad. Panthers and Bears, Thursday Night Football, epic stuff. The two teams that were, you know, kind of competing for the number one pick along with the Houston um, well, they really weren't. It was Houston, the Houston Texans, and the Bears, and then the Bears ended up trading with the Panthers after the Bears earned the number one pick in the draft to get some assets. The Bears win their third game of the season. They're three and seven now in our NFC North roundup. The Panthers, with Adam Thielen talking about possibly going to the Super Bowl, so there was an article kind of making fun of that statement early in the season, as any thought of the Panthers going to any Super Bowl is like. I don't know. It'd be the it'd be the comeback of the century. Like say if the um, the Bears beat the uh, or or no, like my fantasy team. Here I go making it about me again. I'm sorry. I'll just say it though because it was a crazy story. I had a fantasy football team in the year twenty. No, it wasn't twenty. It was well, it's two thousand. I can't remember what year it was. Two thousand two. Yeah, two thousand two. We were three and seven. Three and seven. And it was a situation if I lost one more game, I'd have missed the playoffs. What happened? I, I signed a couple guys that were free agents. One was named, because <laughs> this is 2002, remember. These are two names that weren't really huge household names yet. Well, one of them was a little bit. Heinz Ward, free agent, wide receiver off of Pittsburgh. 
And Clinton Portis, who was just starting to come into his own, just out of like, you know, he was finally becoming the starting running back in Denver. And I was undefeated the rest of the year. I mean, I won it all. Crazy. Crazy. Lucky, yes. But at the same time, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> sometimes sometimes luck and good are a combination, right? And it's the last time I won a fantasy cha football championship. So because I retired not long after that out of frustration. Anyhow, Tyson Badgett. <laughs> I don't know why I told you that, but I did. Tyson Badgett, it's true, though. I did stop playing. I play hockey and other ones, but I got tired of the football ones because it's frustrating. Uh, Bryce Young, only 185 yards and 38 attempts. Oof, that's not your, not your cred. Tyson Badgett, yeah, this is not great football at all. You go from uh, Seattle versus the Washington Commanders, pretty good stuff, actually. And then you get a game like this, but at least Dr. Foreman did something for the Bears. 80 yards on the ground with a touchdown. That's not bad. Very consistent. And only 11 for a long. That's crazy when you think about it. Pretty consistent. Bears had three sacks, and the Panthers had zero sacks in the game. And Adam Thielen with six catches for 42 yards. Sounds a lot like last year. Lame. Um, but, yep, the Bears were kind of hanging around in last place and whatever. They don't really care that much. The other team that's going to be hanging around in last, uh, not last place, but probably third the rest of the year because I don't think they're catching the Vikings because they lost to the Steelers today. And a lot of people were thinking the Steelers are overrated and blah, blah, blah. They're not as good as their record, blah, blah, blah. They're not that good. Well, they beat the Packers, whatever it is, 6-3 and three for the Steelers. Congratulations to them. Kenny Pickett didn't turn the ball over, but it wasn't anything special. And Jordan Love looks like he's Jordan hated in Green Bay. Just above 50% completion percentage with two interceptions to go with his two touchdowns, to be fair. That's nice and everything, but A.J. Dillon, great on the ground with a 40-yard scamper and 70 total yards and only nine carries. Aaron Jones got stifled over and over again. Jaden Reed with five catches for 84 yards. He was pretty good for Green Bay. Mr. Favre or whatever, the, the Favre Award or the Aaron Rodgers Award. We'll say Favre if you want to go with history, but Green Bay Packers dropped a 3-6. and six. Third place is definitely their destiny this year, and the Bears just might catch them for third. Who, who knows? But uh, maybe we don't want the Packers to sink too far and then say, yeah, let's cut ties with that. Let's cut uh, bait with uh, this Jordan Love guy, and then uh, let's take this other blue chip guy and see what happens because they just might jump right back into the next 15 years of another legend that'd be great, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be great? I think it's the Vikings' turn to have a legend. The legend of Josh Dobbs. The legend of uh, um, Jalen Jalen Hall. Yeah. Or Jaron Hall. Yeah, let's get Jaron Hall out there. The legend, right? He did look good. Jalen Roran, the other Jalen. That's who's throwing me off here. 101 yards for Pittsburgh. Awesome. Awesome. Najee Harris, 82 yards. They just ran all over this pack, uh, Packer team, did the Steelers, and they got the job done. And that's what matters most. They ran for 205 yards, two touchdowns, almost six yards a carry on those 36 carries. Awesome performance by the Pittsburgh Steelers on the ground. Kenny Pickett, who's had much better games, um, hasn't been too hot the past the past few. He's not been good. But the Steelers are 6-3, and three and all right, they're hanging in there. It's a well-coached team. But unfortunately, the Vikings' chances of catching the, the Lions, well, it's not that impossible, but it's not that likely either. What are we, a game and a half behind? And in the NFL, that's kind of a bit. Detroit, you know, the Detroit Lions just might end up lioning again, but we'll see. They look like a good team, and you know what? More power to them. If they continue to kick some butt, and it's they might go on a real playoff run this year, more power to them. I'm not rooting against them unless it's against us or maybe the Niners, but I might even cheer for Detroit over the Niners just, just for the sake of, like, I don't know. It's like a rivalry that dates back to the 1950s. I'm not kidding. That was when Detroit actually won championships. That's why there was a tweet last week when the Texas Rangers won the World Series that uh, the Minnesota Vikings are the oldest franchise in you know in the core four sports to not win a championship. But Detroit played football in the 50s. Yeah, they did. But they won a championship in the 50s. They won multiple championships. It just because just the Super Bowl didn't happen in the 1950s doesn't mean Detroit wasn't winning championships. So Detroit's won championships, folks. Yeah. Detroit's won championships. A lot of you know that, and a lot of you don't know that. 
And sometimes I, I, I forget that, like, oh, Detroit, <laughs> what a joke of a friend. Yeah, they haven't been good for the most part, but they did win championships in the 50s, so we have no bragging rights over even Detroit. Do you realize that? Every team in the NFC North has multiple championships except us. That sucks. <laughs> that really sucks. I mean, heck, Gopher football is the same way, though. Like, we won championships in, what, the, what was our last title in, like, the early 60s? And then we had multiple titles in the 30s and stuff. 30s. I guess we can hang our head on national championships in the 30s. Sorry, David Montgomery, the former Bear. Great game. Absolutely awesome. 175 yards on the ground. Scampered away. Jamar Gibbs with a couple of TDs. Detroit also ran for 200 yards in the game. Even better than what the um, Steelers did to the Packers. It's impressive. And this is against the LA Chargers. Um... Yep, the other L.A. team, not where Jared Goff played. But Jared Goff, 333 yards. Man, great game. Two-thirds, literally completed two-thirds of his passes. That's not that great, but good enough. It's above average, right? Well above average. Two touchdowns, 122 quarterback rating. Justin Herbert with four touchdowns, way above average, but did have an interception like he just want to do on occasion. A epic back-and-forth battle, 41-38. to the Chargers were hanging in there and trying and trying and trying. They had 14 points in that fourth quarter, but Detroit hung on and got the job done, and they are 7-2. and two. And this is a very impressive road win for the Detroit Lions, who are 4-1 and one on the road, which would also make them 3-1 and one at home. Pretty good. Detroit's going to be a stiff competition, and it's kind of cool and exciting when you consider how the Vikings have been on a pretty good run. And we are in second place. We're legitimately in second place in the division. We're like right there and we still have to play both games against the Lions home and away. So buckle up, folks. This could be pretty fun. This could be very fun. I mean, if we split, split with Detroit, who knows? And if we sweep Detroit, wow. If we get swept, well, yeah, there's, there's that too, but <clears throat> sorry, there's that too. Um, which could happen because Detroit's excellent and they can win on the road. I like Detroit, except when they play us or maybe the, I don't know, Niners or something. Um, Patriots, well, I, yeah, I like the Patriots, but not like I used to because it's not the same. It's just not. Um, they, you know, they're not the home team. They're not the Vikings. Uh, Jets are now up 9-3, by the way. That's kind of late to the party. But, uh, yes, the Bills and Broncos will be playing tomorrow. The Broncos are 3-5. and five. The Bills are 5-4. and four. This one's going to be in... Orchard Park, New York. New York, where the Bills will be playing. Um, I would like to go back a week. Yes, the Vikings beat Atlanta. And now we're going to dig around and talk about the Denver Broncos here. We're also going to look at history, which isn't too rich because Vikings and Broncos didn't play that many times. But there was some interesting... Uh, what the fudge knucker? Yeah, well, okay, click there. That's where you want to click. Okay. Broncos, what's the last game they played against the Chicago Bears? No, I'm kidding. Actually, they did play them this what the flip. Okay, so they had the bye last week. That's great. <sighs> so, <sighs> Labor Day weekend. Okay, yeah, that's about it, though. Jeez. Yeah, because obviously they, did, they are playing this week, but it's tomorrow. See, so it's kind of annoying. And they got beat. Uh, they did beat the Chiefs, so their last win was against the Kansas City Chiefs, so I guess it's a decent little... Thing to look at, to look at the Broncos when they're actually successful. Russell Wilson insanely efficient in the game in terms of the fact he only attempted 19 passes and threw for three touchdowns. And, um, yeah, the Broncos took the, took apart the Chiefs, and that's kind of impressive. A nice home win for the Denver Broncos. The Chiefs lost their first road game of the season. Those ugly sons of guns aren't playing this week, so good riddance to that. Russell Wilson did fumble twice, but lost it only once. Russell Wilson is known to turn the ball over a bit. Um, we finally beat him a few years back. He'd been undefeated against the Vikings, historically. Uh, this was back when he was still with Seattle. I believe it was his final season in Seattle, when clearly things were going amiss. Pardon me. Sipping coffee here. Um, Denver's definitely got some talent, though. Ah, uh, Javante Williams. They have some talent. They're not that good. Jerry Judy's a guy a lot of people have been a fan of. He's a bit of a household name. Cortland Sutton. Cortland Sutton. Cortland Sutton. He sounds like he's from 
sounds like it's from um, from Britain somewhere, but I don't think so. No, he's not. Um, 380 yards, good for him. But six receiving touchdowns. So Cortland Sutland has definitely been one of the favorites of your guy, Russell Wilson, Jerry Judy, the judge, just kidding. 336 yards and only one TD on 27 catches. Definitely a young guy, first round pick in 2020. And of course, Russell Wilson is the main quarterback in Denver. We all know that, and he's getting paid $100 billion. His, you know, 16 touchdowns, four interceptions isn't that bad. Years ago, you'd look at that and you'd be like, oh, that's a stud. Nowadays, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah but I, I don't know. It's the chemistry with him. It's just not that great. He's projected to throw for 34 touchdowns and 9 INTs. Again, years ago, you'd look at that and be like, it's pretty good. Uh, his last five games, 10 touchdowns and only 2 INTs. Ratings, yep, he's been around 100 with his ratings all the way. It's ironic when you think about all that. Again, it's Sunday Night Football, which I'm not super excited about the whole Sunday Night Football thing at all. Uh, Russell Wilson still, you know, he, he can be a threat to run. But, man, he's 34 already. Hard to believe coming in out of Wisconsin, of course. He was a third-round pick. Josie, the Vikings could have had him, of course. We could have, but we didn't get him, you know, because we just didn't. Um, looking for something else here, and I'm not sure why I'm not seeing it. Uh, obviously, he was a huge threat to run in the past. But generally speaking, yeah, like he'd have 500, 600, 800 yards. He's got 201 yards on the ground, which is actually almost as much as last year. So Russell Wilson's definitely been better this year than last. Generally speaking, his yards per carry way higher, got a yard and a half more. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. But obviously he's still a threat to run, but again, not as much as the past. He's not going to get 800 yards on the ground or anything crazy like that. Uh, this season, he's probably going to wind up with like 400-ish, which is still pretty good compared to, you know, Kirk Cousins or something. Okay, okay, too soon? I'm sorry. Sorry I had to say it, but I'm just kidding. Some quarterbacks are mobile and some aren't, dang it. But um, we'll look at the history here in a second. I'm kind of bouncing and thinking and my mind's wandering all over the place. Uh-huh. And this will be, yep, in Denver, unfortunately for us, on NBC, which those are, and I guess Russell Wilson historically, so it's like history is pointing towards the Broncos for sure in this game, unfortunately. And both teams are on a nice, influential run. That first half, the way it was going for the Vikings with Josh Dobbs, that's like, ain't nothing gonna stop us now. He might as well be playing that song, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now, you know, by, uh, what's the name of that show, or that band, Star Starship? Nothing's gonna stop us now. <laughs> What's that other one? Ain't no stopping us now. That's where the ain't came from. Yeah, that's a 70s song where, you know, um, Starship is 80s. 80s are a little better, but 70s rock too. The thing, the Vikings and Broncos have only played 15 times. 15 times. Vikings lead the season series 8 and 7. The all-time series. Of course, we've never played in the postseason because what would that be if we did? A, probably a Super Bowl championship, unless it was the twenty, or unless it was the nineteen ninety eight Super Bowl. I think the Broncos probably would have won that game, but who knows? Gosh, you know what's really weird? The first little page, which would have been the eleventh matchup, was already after in the ninety eight season. That is the darnest weirdest thing ever. First game between these two was in nineteen seventy two, and the Vikings were just starting to get good. 23 to 12, just starting. The Vikings were good already. 23 to 20, victory for the Vikings. An overtime win, 12 to 12 to 9 in 1978. Season opener, very meh. On 9/11, just a few years before 9/11. We'll talk about that later. Um, I don't know. We'll never talk about it. Broncos in '81, a aging, not so good, transitioning, changing Vikings team. 19 to 7 in Denver. Uh, well, he won the first game. The first game ever between the Vikings and Broncos was in Denver. The Vikings lost multiple games in Denver years later after winning in the Met in 78. So the Vikings and Broncos played in the Met once. That's it. Just once. That's kind of sad, but at least the Vikings were undefeated in the Met against the Broncos. Um, finally, in 1987, was the next time we hosted 
the Broncos. Nine whole years later in the Metro Dome, 34-27 to during that magical 1987 season where the Vikings had some bad games because we had poor replacement players during the strike. And then the Vikings uh, started showing their true colors once the postseason rolled around and almost won the Super Bowl that year. If we could have played the Broncos in that Super Bowl, I'm guaranteeing the Vikings win that game. But guess what? That's uh, 36 years ago. So unfortunately, we can't replay that one. 1990, a mediocre, crappy Vikings team still found a way to beat the Broncos. 27-22, 91. Vikings lost to Broncos. Very mediocre Viking team. 93. Okay, I kind of remember this one. Jim McMahon was quarterback of the Vikes. Did he quarterback in this game? A close 26-23. We beat John Elway, and this was in Denver. I have very vague memories of this one. Father Vez made like a bunch of kicks. Yep. I have vague memories. Salisbury was the quarterback. Yikes, but he threw for 366 yards. John Elway, 30 attempts, only 290, and he had a touchdown and two touchdowns and interception. Roger Craig, man, the running game was pretty weak. Barry Bird, God. Old names right there. Chris Carter, 134 yards. Anthony Carter, 111. Impressive. Legendary Steve Jordan that we just talked about. Six catches, 85 yards. Interesting. Yep, Shannon Sharp. Man, he was already around. Yeah, he was a stud, isn't he? He was a damn stud back then. I don't remember that game. What was I, playing Nintendo or something at the time? Or Super Nintendo? I don't remember that game. Huh. And I have a crazy good memory. Because I absolutely remember 96. Where the Broncos looked like everything, everything like a Super Bowl championship team that year. Only to get beat by the bleeping Jaguars in the second round. Oh, that was heartbreaking. Broncos 11-1. and one, And the Vikings were going to win that game. You realize that? Until the final play of the game, John Elway throws the ball into the end zone. It wasn't like this big Hail Mary or anything. But they were moving. The Vikings were ahead. The Vikings defense was solid. This is in the Dome. Everybody's watching and everything. It's a close, epic game. I think it was a second half group or whatever. 11-1 and one Broncos. And the ball gets tipped up in the air. Looked like we were going to defend it and knock it away. And the clock would expire and the Vikings would win. And, and uh, Ed McCaffrey, the father of Christian McCaffrey, big, tall, lanky, wide receiver of the Denver Broncos, hauls it in and the Broncos win on a touchdown on the final play of the game. Fudge knucking son of a biscuit. Uh, <laughs> I was so mad. I was so mad. Yeah. Who could forget that one? Who could forget it? If you got to see it, you're going to remember it forever. And that's what happened. The, one of the luckiest bounces I've ever seen. And John Elway didn't celebrate. He's not like the guys of today where they go, ah, ha, 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 you know, running around the place, doing all these dances and pretending you're, you pulled your hamstring and stuff. No. John Elway just had a serious look on his face, like, okay, all right, yep, yep, got it. I made it, or yep, yep, we, we made it. I forget if they, yep, I forget what the deal was, but it was just kind of like, oh, it was so frustrating. He didn't celebrate at all. It was just, all right, cool. And the Broncos go to 11-1. and one. Vikings drop to 6-6. Six and six. We did make the playoffs that year and got trounced by the Cowboys. 99, yeah, Halloween night in 1999, the Broncos were not the same. Terrell Davis was out for the season after getting hurt in the season opener. Oh, this could have been the Super Bowl last year. Maybe the Vikings would have won. Whatever. We were 4-4 four and four with the win. Broncos are 2-6. and six. No more John Elway. He retired. Um, yep, John Elway retired. And a guy named uh, Terrell Davis was out for the year with an ACL at the beginning of the season. Jeff George, this was during our little run to try to get back and make the playoffs and go on a run. The 99 Vikings were good with Jeff George at quarterback. And we did win this game, and it was like cool and everything, Brian Greasy. But at the end of the day, you know, yay. Vikings were just 500. We were just kind of coming out of the doldrums of hell after getting beat by a terrible Detroit team. Let's move a little faster. I apologize. 03, that was the game against uh, Mr. What was the name of that guy? I forget that quarterback's name, but this was the game I remember. Yep, Steve Beerline. Yep, former Arizona quarterback. I kept thinking Arizona, 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 where he had a nasty dislocated finger at one point in the game. Ultimately threw three interceptions. He didn't have a good game. And then Steve Beerline's finger was dislocated. The Vikings ended up winning. 
Um, Danny Cannell, God, that's an old name. I believe he was the former New York Giants quarterback for a minute. Um, called up a great game and everything, 133 quarterback rating. But uh, And there's Clinton Portis. That's my guy right there. A year later, 117 yards on the ground against the Vikes, but we end up winning the game. Randy Moss, 151 yards, but no touchdowns. Mo freaking Williams. Cool, man. Good memories there. Mo Williams. Mm. Shannon Sharp was still playing, too, with all those rings. Well, two rings. Vikings would lose a heartbreaker on, uh, in 2007 that helped knock the Vikings out of the playoffs versus the Broncos. It was kind of around that time where everything was going downhill. 2011, a terrible Vikings team lost to the Broncos. With, uh, nope, he was not the quarterback yet. I wonder who was the quarterback of the uh, Broncos on December 4th, 2011. Who was their quarterback? Tim Tebow. He, he lived, and he had one of the best games of his life. I kind of remember this now. Only 10 attempts. 10 attempts. Threw for 202 yards and 10 attempts. 149 quarterback rating. Ponder and Joe Webb. Yuck. Yuck, Ponder and Joe Webb. Vikings ended up losing that game in a close one. Joe Webb. Oofda. 2015. Great, great game, but the Vikings ended up losing kind of in semi-heartbreaking fashion. Just could not finish. Broncos went to 4-0. and And the Broncos were kind of a surprise good team that year. After uh, blowing golden opportunities the previous two years, you know, and then getting smoked in the Super Bowl by the um, smoked in the Super Bowl by Seattle a couple of years earlier, upset in the first round or second round, a great Broncos team, but upset in the second round by Baltimore, who went on to win the Super Bowl for the second time in their franchise history. But this Broncos team kind of surprised everybody. Nobody saw this team doing what they did. They went on to win the Super Bowl that year. Crazy. And the last time the Vikings and Broncos played, 27-23 to victory by the Vikings. A good Vikings team in 2019. Not a great team, but a good team. I'm trying to think who the quarterback was. Broncos were only 3-7. and seven. Vikings were 8-3. and three. Great season. Kirk Cousins and all of us. Three touchdowns, no interceptions. 319 yards. Classic Kirk Cousins against a not real good team in the, in the bank. Yep, great game. Portland Sutton. Yep, still there. <laughs> Brandon Allen? I don't even remember that guy hardly. Oof, yeah, very forgettable name. Brandon Allen. I barely remember the son of a gun. That's weird. He's on several, so yeah, because he's one of those, he's a journeyman and didn't really do anything. Kind of a backup. He was in, yep, I remember him with Cincinnati a little bit. Yep, and then he's on the 49ers right now. Yep, not doing anything, and that's fine. <laughs> but, um, yep, at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to be an easy game for the Vikings. I know I'm taking this way too long. I don't think it's going to be an easy game. Just lots of good memories of the Vikings and Broncos for some reason. Lots of history, even though it's only 15 games. But there's a lot of history involved um, between these two for some reason. These AFC games, I don't know, they kind of trigger a lot of memories because you only play them a few times, you know. Um, where am I going here? Does, does the Vikings crystal ball end... Does the Vikings crystal ball end? Does the Vikings uh, uh, glass slipper come to an end temporarily? It would just be for one week if they do, because maybe the Vikings get back on track right away. We'll see how things go after this. But you know what? I got a feeling Josh Dobbs is going to have a. Uh, I think he's going to have another really good game. I think the Vikings have a chance here, and I do believe that Justin Jefferson, the almost forgotten because he's been out for so long, Justin Jefferson. Is going to return. I think that's going to really help spark things. And you might even get K.J. Osborne back. You might have full uh, three full receivers back again. Even though Brandon Powell deserves all the credit in the world. I mean, still keep him involved somehow if you can. I think he deserves it. He's done a good job for the Vikings. Um, obviously, T.J. Hawkinson, you know, he's going to always be the factor he is. He was a factor immediately last year. But Josh Dobbs with some, uh, you know, some help there. In the receiving core, you might be getting the you know the the number one and number three receiver back to help. Obviously, the number one receiver. You still got Jordan Addison, who's spectacular. Um, T.J. Hawkinson, yep, he was hurt with ribs today. He you know it's like a Michael Jordan kind of game with a rib injury or Kobe Bryant with the rib injuries. Uh, Jordan didn't have rib injuries, but other stuff kind of injuries he played through and stuff over his career and was a hero and all that. But uh, great game by Hawkinson, nonetheless. 
I don't know where to go with this. That's why I keep bouncing back and forth. But I already talked about all the different comparisons of the Vikings and the Broncos, generally speaking. I, I don't know. Vikings history versus Sean Payton's kind of all over the place. Um, I don't know. Denver's playing better. I got a feeling they don't beat Buffalo. I think Buffalo smokes them tomorrow. I really do, because Buffalo needs to get their butts in gear. They are not going to 500. They just aren't. Uh, Denver... The Vikings are going to beat Denver, I think. It's not going to be easy, but the Vikings will beat the Denver Broncos. Final score among the likes of, let's go with 27-20. to 27-20, The Vikings win by a touchdown in Denver, which would be a pretty impressive win. Justin Jefferson will get a touchdown and will eclipse 100 yards in the game. And Josh Dobbs will be a big factor with being able to escape for those, um, you know, like, like in being able to escape on those key third downs. I think that's going to be a difference maker compared to the past. Um, where the Vikings have a hard time in those situations. So, the Vikings running game did look pretty good today, believe it or not. But I do believe the Vikings win 27-20 over the Denver Broncos. Let's get to fan interaction. And we're going to hear from Mad Martin again, I believe. bizarre couple of weeks we've had beating San Francisco Cousins playing at his highest level I think we've seen in purple followed by Mr. Reliability blowing out his Achilles for the next week I don't know if that tells you anything other than the football gods clearly don't want us to win this season and then you get Jalen Hall who comes out second drive looks incredibly promising. Uh, I know it was a scripted sequence of plays, but it sort of showed you that, hey, maybe this kid has got something. Uh, he gets a uh, concussion, and you bring out a guy who's been on the roster, what, four or five days, not taking any snaps. And you find a way to win with that guy. So what does that tell you? What does that tell me? It tells me that I think we have our coaching Positions well and truly sorted. What Brian Flores has done with the defence, considering, in essence, it's the same piece as last year, is quite remarkable. And KOC seems to be becoming very, very good. I, I, I still am buzzing from that result. The, the fact that you can bring a guy in that barely knows the plays, you can give him the plays through the headset, break those plays down, and he can play as well as that, I think indicates that you don't need to spend big bucks at the quarterback position with someone like KOC as the head coach. Now, I'm not saying that Dobbs or Hall are the long-term solution at that position. But what it does show you that if you're prepared to draft relatively high for a mobile quarterback with a strong arm, might not be the greatest quarterback in the world, but... If he's good, the chances are that KOC could elevate him to great. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do going down the stretch. I guess you go with Dobbs until perhaps he does lay an egg. My, my concern with Dobbs was the fact that his ball security was a little bit worrying, you know, those two fumbles. Um, but the defence managed to save us from a total disaster. And he played incredibly well in that second half. So, you know, you roll with Dobbs for a while. I would love to see Hall back in there and give him an extended period of time to see what he can do and if he is the solution. Now, we know Cousins has gone out. Obviously, with that um, Achilles, it's going to drop the price for what he's worth or what he thinks he's worth. Um, so perhaps they do bring him back as a bridge. I don't know. I would be quite happy now. I felt a weight had been lifted on Sunday when Cousins wasn't there. Because let, let's go back to when dear old Rick decided to bring the guy in against the wishes of the head coach. 
And what you ended up with, in essence, was a marriage made in hell. And we have had purgatory, really, results-wise, for five years. Yes, great effort last year. But it was really, I felt, you, you get to the playoffs, you're going to get knocked out pretty quickly. And that was the case. And I'm still not convinced Cousins is the man that would lead you to the promised land. Now, if you can bring in someone that's perhaps better than Hall and Dobbs, if that's the case, if, if they can, you know, if, if one of them can play at that kind of level, perhaps you don't need to. All you need to do then is pay them cheap money, build the monster roster around them, and let's go rock and roll towards the Super Bowl or a deep run in the playoffs, which would be a damn sight more exciting than what we've had over the half past five years. But what I really hope to see is um, that we can hold on to Flores, strengthen the defence, because what he's achieved, I said that I think is remarkable. So it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm excited again, which is something I've not been for quite a while, because you just don't trust the quarterback position um, to get the job done. And, and the fact that JJ's been out for five weeks and we've won, that's insane as well. So... There's been a lot of detractors of KOC. There's been detractors of Quasi. Um, but these players they've managed to draft and have brought in are doing remarkably well. I think, I think the Dobbs trade is amazing. You know, they've lost basically nothing for a guy that could take them on a decent run. I mean, I know, I, and I know it screws us over in the draft yet again, and we're not going to be in the position to go and draft one of those potential franchise quarterbacks. But if you've got the quarterback whisper in KOC, perhaps you don't need to. Right, I shall get back to you at a later date this season. Skull brothers and sisters, you take care, Joey. And I'm just about to listen to the podcast. Take it easy. And I thank you so much for that call in. Mad Martin, Dave Martin, Mad Martin out of Northern Scotland. Thank you very much for the call in. And yeah, it's interesting now. We're kind of at a, you know, it's going to be some interesting decisions made in the offseason about the whole quarterback situation. And Josh Dobbs, how is he going to continue in the next few weeks? It's going to be very interesting. And it's also interesting how, again, you're noticing the creativity of Kevin O'Connell. I was going to get more and more and more into that. Uh, should the Vikings, or if the Vikings had a more positive second half, but it was like such a negative second half, it almost kind of threw me off, but uh, in a lot of ways kind of getting me back on track where I should have been in the first segment, talking more and more about how, yep, the creativity is very much there, and yes, that's kind of like, in a lot of ways, it's almost like, it's 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 weird, like with Cousins at quarterback, obviously, unmistakable arm talent, accuracy, and all that, you know, um, but obviously the lack of mobility and such, but also the fact that, you know, see, Cousins, there was this there was this offense that was set for him. You know, it, it's there for Kirk Cousins to, uh, you know, for Kirk Cousins to execute the offense win, uh, with, right? You know, you know your limitations in this area. You, you use your strengths in that area. But then you get Josh Dobbs, who can throw the ball, maybe not as great as Kirk Cousins, but also, but still very capable of throwing the football for the most part. Only had one really ugly pass that was just, he just missed TJ Hawkinson. In an opportunity that was not helpful, put us in a you know a pun- another punting situation, one of several in the second half. But then also the mobility and all that uh, it makes a huge difference for the Minnesota Vikings offense to be more creative, including again the um, direct snap to Ty Chandler, which got him into the end zone, which is a great thing as well. And you hear about that some more here in fan interaction. But yeah, great calling, and uh, yeah, I mean it's such it's absolutely you know. Absolutely like a whole different ball game now with uh, the Vikings offense and the capabilities of, of uh, you know, the capabilities are a little different now where you feel that uh, you can see more of what Kevin O'Connell's gift is with the, you know, the more creative offense. It's it's very much, very much evident where, uh, where Kirk Cousins, I'm not going to say he's holding the team back or was holding the team hostage or holding them back, but it almost looked like it in a way. It almost looks like it just they were kind of too worried about catering to Kirk Cousins rather than being creative and making things more interesting down the stretch here for the Minnesota Vikings offense. And we've won five games in a row. 
obviously, and things were going well before Kirk Cousins got hurt, so that's a huge factor as well. Um, hearing a lot of weird background noise here. I don't know what's who's making the noise. Weird. Where is the last? Where are the episodes? Okay. Truly at a crossroads. That's not the right one. Weird. Did nobody retweet the last episode? Surely, surely they did. But I'm not seeing it. That's extremely weird. Okay, whatever. I don't understand why that is. I don't know if I read this from Dave Hickey. He was saying, great game by Dobbs and the whole team, really. I was looking forward to see Jaron play. I feel, bad. I feel bad for him. Nope, I think I did read that last week, but I'll read it again. That's fine. So here we go. At Pruel Mafia Show is the X account. And then the other one is, of course, Instagram. That's coming up. Ty Chandler, that one is also a Purple Mafia show on Instagram. Uh, Tanae Brown coming in out of New Zealand says, Ty Chandler is such a strong runner. I wonder why he hasn't been getting offensive snaps until now. Uh, yep, and he really is. I was saying it's about time, huh? Supposedly it was blocking related, but clearly the guy can play. Both he and Akers should have gotten more snaps before Akers got hurt. Janae responds with, hopefully he continues to make Im an impact today and can solidify himself in the backfield. He made a nice block on one of Dobbs' runs, too. Just keep making plays, please. Ha ha. Yep, absolutely. And if he does get better at blocking, well, there you go. And, I don't know, Kirk Cousins, I think blocking for Kirk Cousins is just a kind of a different ball game than with uh, Dobbs. You know, you don't necessarily have to go crazy to block for Dobbs, necessarily. I was saying how oh, tight Chandler's a blazer. I was saying, awesome play by Dobbs, staying on his feet and hitting Hawkinson for the first down to get the Vikings to go to first and goal. Yep, that was good. And that was right before the direct snap to Ty Chandler. Um, Denny Brown, Denny Brown, anyway, says, it's a very impre impressive X factor he can bring. Let's see, I'm guessing it has to do with uh, Dobbs. Yep, I was saying, yep, the awesome play by Dobbs staying on his feet. So it's just what I just read. Tanae Brown responds with, It's a very impressive X factor he can bring to the game. Also love the keeper he had earlier in the drive for a long run. What he lacks in throwing, he makes up with his legs. Yep, absolutely. What an asset Dobbs is, is was my response. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. Tanae, respond, or Tanae has another tweet saying, Hopefully he continues to make an impact today and can solidify himself in the... Yep, that's okay, I already read that one. Sorry, the Ty Chandler... Dave Hickey coming in out of Iowa says they need to utilize Chandler a lot more. He's super fast. I agree. Mad Martin, Dave Martin says, fun watch, brother. When was the last time the Vikings put up 24 or more points in the half class? Because I cannot remember. And to do it while well, their opponent isn't within a single score. And that was a lot of fun. It's too bad everything kind of unraveled in the second. That was stupid. But luckily the Vikings still hung on and won. And Makai Blackland brought in his second. That's right, his second as a rookie, Fran Tarkington Award. That Makai Blackman is the real deal, in my opinion. I think he's a shutdown corner for many years to come if he can stay healthy, God willing. Byron Murphy, said, uh, excuse me, Dave Hickey is saying, Byron Murphy is costing us big time. We need a drive here. I knew Joseph would miss that field goal too. Yeah, that was so stupid. Yeah, things were really unraveling at that point. It was so damn frustrating. Oh, you have the touchdown against Brian, uh, Byron Murphy. And, of course, the dumb play call. The dumb decision to just kick from 54 yards out. And, of course, he missed. Of course, he did. Mad Martin, a new one, says, uh, A game of two halves. The offense looks outstanding in the first half, but the D saved our collective arses in the second. Yep, well said. Dave Vicky says, Another game we should have put away early. But instead, we let them hang on and make a game of it. I would have to give the targeting award to Dobbs and Hawkinson. Yep, okay. And the punter to KOC for some questionable play calling in the second half. Yep, that kick. Yeah, with you there, Dave. 100%. 100%. That wraps up the Twitter. Let's get to Instagrammy. We have Arizona one. There it is. Arizona over Atlanta. I turned off the Wolves game. I feel like a jerk. Why am I watching the freaking Raiders and uh, Jets? Who cares, right? Raiders and Jets. And I went to the wrong channel. Forgot about the Wolves, man. Forgot about the Wolves. Probably because I got repulsed by looking at freaking Steph Curry. I hate that guy. Sorry. Steph Curry, uh, Travis Kelsey, Patrick Mahomes, get out of my face. <laughs> I don't think there's a single hockey player I despise nearly as much as those guys. <laughs> I don't think there is. 
Baseball? Ah, there's a couple. I don't know. We'll just leave that alone. Not that many, though. Yeah, freaking Bregman of Houston. I can't stand Bregman on Houston. Uh, what's the other guy? The little guy on Houston, too. I can't stand him because they all cheated and they're jerks. They were such jerks about it at the time. Yeah, I couldn't stand him. Sorry. Anyhow, let's get to Instagram. I'm a bit distracted here. Okay. One of these days I'll get there, and I apologize. Yeah, it's Purple Mafia Show. It's one word. Please follow the Instagram if you could. I'd greatly appreciate it. Comments. Woohoo! There are comments. At least I think there are. Yeah, there's comments, which is a good thing. Doggone it. Yes, sir. For the you know, last week, I didn't pass out stars, did I? Um, I'm going to say, like, uh, Man Martin and Mark Carlson bring in the gold, Tanae Brown and Dave Hickey bring in the silver for last week. So now we'll continue. Mike Dale is back in the his house. No, he's back in the house. I don't do the his house thing too much. Mike Dale says, okay, let's uh, try to get this chronologically in order. If I was saying Ty Chandler's a blazer. Nobody liked it. That hurts my feelings. Mike Dale says, F it. Maybe we don't need to draft a quarterback. This kid impresses the heck out of me. And that would be Josh Dobbs. Yeah, wasn't that something? Uh, Mark Carlson responds with, like, no, it looks like a match. What a player. And, yeah, it, you can uh, really utilize Kevin O'Connell's, um, you know, you can utilize Kevin O'Connell's talents. You can. You, his his gift of, you know, his his gift, his offensive prowess. Mike Dell says it's obvious that Hawk is Dobbs' favorite target. Yeah, tub of ice for Big Hawk. After this game, yeah, yeah, with the ribs. I tell you, I've never seen a guy his size get knocked, blasted, and thrown around as much as him. True. True. Mark Carlson says, what a game. I enjoy stomping on the Saints for three quarters. Then with seconds left in the game, slamming the door and sending the whole team of cheaters back to their fans, directly to the pit of misery. Bye-bye. Yeah, but I feel the way about the Houston Astros as well in the baseball world. Even though it's like I'm not a huge Texas Rangers fan, when the Rangers beat Houston, I was very satisfied. When the Twins lost to Houston, I was freaking pissed. Because it's the second time in two years, too, or three years or whatever it's been. So I think the Twins had two suck a year. So it was like a three-year period. Yeah, second time in two years. Second time in four years. Man, why do I have a feeling the Warriors are winning? Yeah, because I had turned it off and it looks like it's halftime. Ah, oh, I hate Steph Curry. Oh, Ugh, go away. God, I can't wait till he's done. I can't stand him. I don't give a damn what a good shooter he is. Comments? Sorry, I'm a jerk. Letting Steph Curry get to me just like uh, Travis Kelsey. That's on me there. Comments? Yep, Mark Carlson with one big one, so no big one from Mike Dale again. Oh, I miss you, Mike. Come on, Mike Dale. I want, I want to see those big ones again. I think there is also a response from... I'm going to go back to the... Yeah, see? See, this was here. This was, yeah, see, I have to check these forever and ever, because if I don't, I'm going to miss some good comments. I think I skipped one once, and I felt like a jerk afterward. Mark Carlson, upon the release of the last episode. Yep, just like how, we, like how we used to do this on Facebook sometimes, too. You know, and a couple other people, I think Gerald and such, have done this where they comment on that. And, uh, you know, and yeah, like you want to comment on the episode. Thank you. I mean, that's a, the nicest thing ever, you know. It, it really is. Unless you're like, the episode sucked, but I doubt. I doubt you're going to say that. At least I would hope. Some people might not like, okay, I'm going to get off it. Mark Carlson, Iowa, says, very entertaining episode. I missed a good game. That's how it rolls sometimes. Speaking of Atlanta, I was in Atlanta in 1995 and 1996. There were some giant billboards along 295, or along 295 that had a Jeff George picture. Yeah, he did play for the Falcons, didn't he, once? Jeff George's picture and a caption that said, Don't come back no more, no more, no more, no more, Jeff George. Yep. Atlanta fans, I guess, had enough. Yep. I guess I could relate to to that after all we had. We went through with Christian Ponder. Okay. A crazy thought. We are on a four-game win streak. That's what it says in the standings. After all my complaining, we win five, four in a row. Crazy. Now all I have to say is, let's win four more. <laughs> Thanks for the great show. Skull Mark from Iowa, and thank you so much for the great comment, Mark. 
greatly appreciate it. And yeah, let's keep winning. Dang it. Let's keep winning for sure. So, the closing game comments. Yeah, Mark's got a nice gem here, looks like. Yep, nice big one. Like uh, like Mike Dale style. Ooh, that's a close basketball game. And now Rudy Gobert's having his ribs like bruised or something. Doggone it. Uh, I hope it's not doesn't have an abdominal injury. Please no. You know, like last year I would have been like good riddance, Rudy Gobert sucks. I, I don't like him. This year, Rudy Gobert's, you know, yeah, that's a rib area. Rudy Gobert's been a stud, man. The Wolves actually look good. We're down by one against the Jackasses. I mean, Golden State Warriors. Anyhow, check out Timberwolves Explosion if you'd like to sometime. Minnesota Timberwolves Basketball Podcast. Come on, Anthony Edwards. Hit that off the... God, what the heck? Sorry. Anyhow, Mark Carlson, I am so sorry. Dishing it out on both sides of the ball for three quarters. Yeah, baby. My instinct says this quarterback is ready to play. He came to play, and he can play. And again, that's Josh Dobbs, of course. I love the deeper passing that we saw today and a quarterback that did not just sit in the pocket and take it. I think the Vikings defense is playing very well. Yes, they are, and they have a great coordinator. And I love defense. Yep, he says, I love defense. I think the more we pressured and rushed, the more flustered and disorganized the Saints' offense looked. Did you notice that the team looked and played like a team? Yeah. Yeah, see? I think the relationship with the coach is starting to shine, so let them shine. It's an uphill battle with everything on the line. <laughs> Weeks back, I said on Purple Mafia, Paul, uh, on the Purple Mafia post that I will believe it when I see it, or something like that. And that was before all the injuries. Now I believe this is a team. They are rough, or they are tough, and playing rough. Skull. Yep. So, yes, the creativity, the chemistry, and, you know, people picking each other up. It does seem more like a, more of a team atmosphere now than it might have during the Kirk Cousins uh, time, which is very interesting. Ah, oh, bleep the stupid Curry. God. Anyhow, um, it does feel so different, though, now. It, it does. And Josh Dobbs adds that other element that we didn't have before, that component called, you know, mobility, because he's really mobile. But also the fact he is an actual quarterback. He's not, not that Cousins wasn't, but he's an actual quarterback. He's not Sean Mannion or somebody that comes in and you're like, yeah, he, you know, like I was kind of ranting about last week. Like he can't even complete a 12-yard pass. Like it was that he was that pathetic. But then you have a guy like Dobbs. Yes, he can complete a 12-yard pass. He might complete a 30-yard pass. Also, also at the same time, he might be able to run for an 11-yard gain on a third and nine or something like that. You know, or maybe after some stupid holding penalty. Uh, you know, he'll be able to scramble around and hit T.J. Hawkinson for a 10-yard gain and put us in at third and four rather than third and 15 or something. You know, so there is stuff like that. It's a, definitely a difference maker, and we really appreciate what Josh Dobbs brings. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully the second half wasn't an indicator of what could come where everything's going to dry up and all that, but at least the Vikings defense picked things up when they needed to despite the fact they were getting pretty tired with the way the Saints were running up the gut and beating the crap out of them up, up the middle. But the Vikings survived another game, and it's a good sign. Um, winning in Denver would be very impressive, and all of a sudden you're 7-4, and four, and uh, yeah, let's go. Let's go to the playoffs. Uh, already got the Christmas lights up and other people in the neighborhood and in random neighborhoods all around starting to put Christmas lights up already, which I'm totally fine with. Uh, I don't think it's too early. I think if it's, you know, a second week of November, I think it's totally fine. Uh, maybe the day after Halloween's pushing it a little bit. A little bit, but whatever. If you're in a department store and you make money selling things like that, Christmas stuff, decorations, okay, what's wrong with selling Christmas decorations on November 1st? I don't think that's really a bad idea, actually. Like, selling, you know, like, oh, yeah, let's put them on the shelves on December 11th. Okay, that's kind of late for some people, don't you think? So that's why I get kind of like, I kind of roll my eyes and people complain, like, how could you do that? Because uh, it's kind of getting to be that time, and why not be prepared to get your stuff? So otherwise, yep, I have my Christmas tree up. It's not fully decorated, but it is lit up right away and all that. And the entertainment center's got the light, you know, you know, like, you know, kind of wrapped around it a bit to make it more lit up in this room, especially in the nighttime. It's so much fun. Um, I don't have it on all day, of course, or anything. But, yeah, um, I really appreciate this time of year, and I talk about it every single year when I'm doing Purple Mafia. I want to get into this final little tiny half segment, half, one millionth of a segment at the end of the show. 
So one other thing, though, if you do like this show, you do like what we do here on Purple Mafia. When I say we, I mean me and all these awesome people like Mark Carlson, Mad Martin, Tanae Brown, Sam Gupta, Dave Hickey. I mean, you guys are, you know, you guys are literally a part of the Pro Mafia family. So when I say when you like what we do here, that's what I mean. Somebody out there, maybe you're kind of new, you know, you're just starting to listen. If you like what we do here, please write a positive rating on uh, Apple Podcast or even just a star rating of any kind. Even if it's just five stars and you don't want to write a review, that helps. It helps the show. It helps the show get out there because as old as the show is, this is an old, 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 old show, but it needs to grow. It's been stagnant. The growth has been stagnant over the years, probably because, you know, there's been so many new ones and they get all these algorithms and my show gets kind of buried underneath all that. So it's a pain. I need to build up the algorithms. And if you guys can help me do that and help grow the show, you know, like above where, where it needs to be, it'd be great. You know, it just, why not? I have no plans to retire or step away from Purple Mafia. In fact, I uh, there's a part of me that feels I'll be podcasting until the day I can't talk anymore. There's a pretty good chance I'll be doing some form of podcast the rest of my life. Pretty good chance. So with that said, please do help the show by simply giving a five-star rating, if you could, on any app that allows you to do so. I, I really would appreciate it, and it really helps grow the show. Have a wonderful week. Put up your Christmas lights if you like, and I guess if you like to wait or you don't celebrate Christmas at all, that's your prerogative. Um, but, uh, yep, I'm just saying how much I enjoy this time of year, and it's a lot of fun. Unfortunately, the cleanups are still not done, and it's a lot of work, But and uh, you know, let's just say I did some work today too. <laughs> but still, you know, all set, ready to go, and got to see the whole game, and yeah, there's that. <laughs> see the whole game and do a lot of work at the same, you know, and all that, you know, all in the same day. Before I sign off, I think I better pass out some stars quick. The star for this episode, boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's really tough. Oh my God. It's so tough because, you know, uh, you guys really all contributed so nicely for this show. Because at least, you know, uh, I, I have such a hard time with it. I, I, I do. Um, obviously the great Colin and insights, Mad Martin's going to bring in the gold, but it's like, my God, <laughs> you guys are so good. Every, every dang one of you, uh, Mark Carlson, man, I, I don't know. It's so hard. Mark Carlson, Mike Dale, Silver, Tanae, and, uh, yeah, Tanae and Dave Hickey will bring in like silver platinum plated bronze i mean you're that good that's how good you guys are so i just want you to know with all of that said have a wonderful week and hopefully the vikings continue to be on a roll